I'm Dana Perino, and this is Perino on Politics. Over the years, colorful Colorado has gone from red to blue. However, will this state be a safe bet for President Biden in 2024? Well, we're going to talk about it. Welcome to Perino on Politics, where we give you everything you need to know from a 30,000-foot view of this week in politics. And joining me today for a closer look at the centennial state and beyond is the host of The Ross Kaminsky Show on KOA Radio in Denver. It is Ross Kaminsky. Thank you for being here with us. And I know you've rearranged your schedule so that we could get your insight, and we appreciate that. Thanks so much for inviting me, Dana. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so the reason I wanted to talk to you is just to get outside of the coast from California or from New York, Washington, D.C., and talk about one, a state I love. Um, I am over 50, 52 years old, and Colorado, when I was a kid, was just a reliably red state. And I just remember it being very Western, in some ways rural. The suburbs were there but and, and growing, and then they grew very rapidly over about 25 years. And Colorado really went almost just from red to blue. Like it was hardly ever purple, right? Like how did that happen? What do you, and and, and did you witness the same thing? I did. Uh, So, I mean, you went to high school and college here and I'm a a little bit older than you, but I've only been here 20 years. But when I got here 20 years ago, Bill Owens was governor. And that's the last time we had a Republican governor. And now no Republican Wait, holds. Wait, Bill any- Owens was the last Republican governor of Colorado? <laughs> yep. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Continue. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? So Colorado does not have a Republican holding any statewide office, not governor, not the other top jobs in the state government and no senator. Uh, there's a few Republican members of the House, but those are not elected statewide. And yeah, I, I've noticed the same thing you have. And what and, do you and, think happened? Like, was it people moving into the state or is this a change of mind? Or I know a lot I, of people are rejecting Republican politics on some level. You know, that's true nationwide. But was it acute in Colorado? So I, I think two things happened. I think that legalized marijuana happened. And I think a lot of folks who are not conservative came here for for le- we were the first state to have legalized recreational marijuana. Washington state had it around the same time. But I think Colorado is a more interesting place to live than Washington state is. So a lot of people and came here for that. that. Got a, Colorado being first really got the majority of the attention. Yes. Yeah. Even when Washington legalized or, or almost the same time, we still got all the attention and we still got all the people who called themselves urban campers. Uh, who were really just 20-something-year-old bums who just wanted to be stoned on 16th Street Mall. So there was that. And then there was also, and and this is going to sound trite, but it's really true, an immense number of Californians moved here. Huge numbers. And I think you'll find this interesting data. So I I used to think, gosh, people are abandoning California because it's become this left-wing place and taxes are incredibly high and all that. Yeah, all the stuff. You know, we don't need to go through all that. And they're coming here and voting for the same people who are ruining their state. And it was actually a listener who pointed out to me, Ross, those are not the Californians who are coming to Colorado. The Californians who are coming here are people who bought a house for $300,000 and now can sell it for a million seven and come to Colorado and buy a place just as nice for 800 grand. Now in ensuing years, Colorado's real estate prices have absolutely exploded and it's much closer to California in price than it used to be. But if you're one of those people, you actually feel like the left-wing politics there drove up the equity in your home. You made a million and a half dollars and you are not a political refugee. You're an equity refugee. And so you come here and you don't have a thought in your head about not voting for liberals. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's happened, and this is happening in other places as well, is that Colorado went from sort of being really focused on oil and gas Right. There was a there was a big oil and gas and uh, industry there. And now there's a lot of finance, a lot of tech. And has that really altered things as well? Uh, especially the tech part, uh, because the tech, I mean, Boulder in particular, but other areas as well are like mini Silicon Valleys. And those tend to 
bring in younger and more liberal workers, right? Finance, uh, you'd probably expect a fair number of Republicans in finance, but not so much in tech. And all the talk of the tech bros in Silicon Valley, we got a heck of a lot of, of that stuff here. And then I'm as disappointed in it as you are, Dana. When I, I, I didn't have any connection to Colorado, I drove through it when I was a kid and thought, gosh, I would love to live there. Mm-hmm. And I always had this view of a kind of Western, libertarian, self-reliant kind of thing that started disappearing around the time I got here, hopefully not because of me. And, you know, you grew up in Colorado, but you're from Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And I wanted Colorado to be what Wyoming is. And Mm -hmm. Wyoming still is. And Colorado isn't. Yeah. So I'm also curious about how sort of the national issues are being manifest there in Colorado. So if you look at what people say are the number one issues, inflation in the economy, um, immigration, crime, mm-hmm. abortion makes the list in some places, in some states. And But maybe start with those top issues that Biden and Trump are both going to be trying to make the case on. How is it playing there out West? So all those things that you said are the top issues. So the big uh, abortion may be a little bit bigger here than in some places, um, not as big as it'll be in Arizona probably in, in this year. But here's The thing for me, and you really noticed it in 2020 and even in 2022, Republic, not Republicans, moderates in the suburbs, the counties you grew up in and around hate Donald Trump, Mm. hate him. And to this day, question then to this day. And the question then becomes, are they so upset about cost of living, about the border, about all those other issues that they that that you raised that they're willing to consider Trump again because they're so sick of Biden. I I don't think on a presidential level, I don't think Trump has any chance at all in the state of Colorado with the possible exception. And I still think he really won't have a chance. But if RFK Jr. makes the ballot in Colorado and takes a few points from Biden, because I there's a lot of debate about this, as you know, like, who does he hurt more? I still think he hurts Biden a little bit more. But I still think this state has has there's no place for Trump here. And what was very interesting in the 2022 elections, you mentioned abortion in the 2022 elections. Democrats ran uh, an unlimited number of abortion related ads against Republican candidates, including the Senate candidate, a guy named Joe O'Day, who was pro-choice. And they still ran abortion ads against him successfully. And their line was, well, if you elect him to the U.S. Senate, he'll support any future Republicans, Mm -hmm. uh, pro-life candidates for the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So even though he's pro-choice, you you should think of him as Mm -hmm. anti-abortion. And and he got crushed. So how do people feel about the economy there? Colorado's economy is doing pretty well. So I think you got to separate the jobs part from the cost of living part. I think in terms of the economy, people are feeling pretty, pretty good here. Uh, But the cost of living is unbelievable. And we've had in this state a particularly huge increase in real estate prices. So a lot of the local political battles have been about property tax relief. And the Democrats just passed a bill that is pretend property tax relief. And so there's going to be a couple of big ballot measures. Uh, At least one has already made the ballot. Another one probably will to prevent this kind of disaster in the future and a lower property tax Mm -hmm. rates as well. But that's been a huge part of the discussion here. Our our state legislature, Democrats have a veto proof or a veto overriding majority in the state House. They're one vote short of that in the state Senate. And Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I both know and kind of like Governor Jared Polis. Mm -hmm. He's nobody's idea of a conservative. He doesn't. um, Some people call him libertarian. But when you're reliant on Jared Polis to protect you from the left, you know you're in trouble. Um, in, uh, Polis has been on America's Newsroom, as has Mayor um, Mike Johnston. Mike Johnston. Johnson or Johnson? Johnston with a T. With a T, yeah, I thought so. Not to be confused with Speaker Mike Johnson. So, and I, again, also, like, nice guy, great guy. Um, one of the reasons we had him on was to talk about immigration, because Denver was one of the cities that was getting buses of migrants. 
that were coming to Colorado. And Mike Johnston, the, the mayor, joins everybody uh, from the other blue cities at the White House about six months ago, begging for help from the Biden administration. And, and help is not on the way. They've been basically told to just go home and try to figure it out on their own and to try to blame Donald Trump for it, which is not working in the polls. I think Trump's numbers on on immigration, if that's your main issue, you trust him more than Biden by something like plus 20. I mean, there's just no question. Um, but I wanted to hear from you how immigration as an issue is affecting people there, not just from the government standpoint, but I know a lot of people who volunteer to try to help. And it is it is a big huge, thorny problem, in addition to an already problematic situation with homelessness and crime, especially in Denver. Yes. So we've spent a few hundred million dollars, I say we, um, Colorado and and Denver has spent most of it. And the way here's how I'm thinking about this. It's an enormous issue, but it's a it's biggest in Denver itself. And Denver is a very, very blue city. So if I asked you, you know, how will San Francisco, San Franciscans vote when they rebel against, say, their school board, which they did. How will that play out in a presidential election? Is it going to be enough of an issue to get them to? Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't see Denverites voting for Trump. I see maybe some of them withholding votes for Biden, and I think that dynamic, if it plays out that way in swing states, could be really interesting. There's going to be a lot of people, Jewish voters too, right? Jewish voters, too, uh, and maybe some black voters. Uh, and, you know, Trump's already yeah, I mean, got very You could strong actually numbers. see the Biden coalition fall apart. And absolutely. I have a theory. You know, this is a place where I test theories because basically it's my podcast and there's no consequences for things I say. But um, I was thinking today about people who did not vote for Trump in 2016 and would not vote for him in 2020 but who might just vote for him in 2024. And I don't know what to call those people yet, but I think that there might be some of them out there. And it could be um, a black man who said, I just, I I can't take it anymore, the economy. Or it might be a Jewish woman who says, I can't stand, I I can't stand what's happening um, in terms of support for Israel and what's happening on campus. I mean, there might be just these issues that either make them stay home or, If they're being given a choice between these two unpopular and older candidates, if they have to hold their nose and vote, they just might do it. They they might. And, you know, if you think about, for example, uh, Joe Biden won Pennsylvania by one point two percent. Right. There's plenty of Jews in the suburbs around Philadelphia. Yeah. And if a lot of those folks, again, I fully understand. So just uh, I've been telling my radio listeners for years that the true home of anti-Semitism in America is on the left, which doesn't mean that there aren't terrible white nationalist, neo-Nazi anti-Semites on the right. They exist. But the anti-Semites on the right are not part of a conservative or Republican coalition. Right. They're fringe and they're always thought of as fringe. But the anti-Semites on the left, they have tenure. And they get invited to all the best cocktail parties mm-hmm. and they're in Congress. They're they're the squad and others. And it's time. It's way past time that my fellow Jews who haven't realized this already realize it now. And they are starting. Many of them are starting to realize it now. And I, I'm I'm not saying that a huge number of them is going to make it all the way to voting for Donald Trump. Although I got to say, I'm not I'm not a huge Trump fan, but I don't think there's ever been a stronger pro-Israel president than Donald Trump Mm. in my lifetime. But if they just withhold their votes from Biden. Yeah, that would be that could be enough to swing the election. And the other thing is, if they're going to withhold their votes from Biden, are they just going to not bother opening their ballot? Which means they're also withholding their votes for the Senate candidate and the Democratic House candidate. So we've know. seen some polling on that. In fact, there was a poll yesterday that showed Trump up by five in Arizona, but Carrie Lake, the Senate candidate on the Republican side, down by 13. 
in the same state. So that that could happen. And people can hold two competing thoughts in their mind at the same time. We've seen ticket splitters before. It's not necessarily mm-hmm. common. But if there's nobody strong at the top, if, if Biden's not strong to you, you might not do it. Before we go to a break, let me ask you about just to explain to everybody some shenanigans. I don't know if they're shenanigans, but the shifting districts, it's kind of hard to keep track of. And people that are listening to this don't necessarily care who one con- congressional district in Colorado. But Lauren Boebert is a congresswoman from Colorado. She's of somebody of some notoriety. And she nearly lost her election in 2022. And then she is cha- moving her districts. And you had Ken Buck, a congressman from Colorado, Republican, retire early. So what's with the Boebert race and can she win it? Right. Okay. So Boebert currently represents the largest congressional district in Colorado. It's most of Western and Southern Colorado. And by geography, it's about half the state. And she, and the district is something like R plus seven. And she won it by only 500 votes last time. And I'm absolutely convinced that if more people in that district had thought that the election would be close, she would have lost. Uh, she she has found a way to make herself quite unpopular by focusing too much on national politics and seeming like she has been too interested in just getting her own face in the news and getting clicks and all that. And she's I think she's changed a little. I think she's become more focused on doing things for constituents and, you know, paying attention to local stuff. But it's probably a little late. So she decided that it, this year, if she were to run again, and she'd be facing the same candidate that almost beat her last time, a guy named Adam Frisch, who is, as Democrats go, pretty moderate and has raised an immense amount of money. She decided she couldn't win, so she moved to eastern Colorado to the district you mentioned, CD4. The problem in this, well, problem, if you are someone who would prefer not to see Lauren Boebert in Congress anymore, and that's where I am, even though I donated to her first campaign for Congress, I'd rather not see her win right now because I simply don't think she has matured into the job. Uh, there are five other candidates in that race, oh. and at least two of them are non are credible non-MAGA candidates. And at this point, it seems somewhat likely because we do not have runoffs in Colorado that Lauren Boebert could win the primary with 25 or 30 or 32 percent of the vote. And if I were betting right now, I guess I would bet that that's what happens, even though if she were facing against she were facing off against just one of the other candidates, I think she'd get crushed. Fascinating. All right. Ross Kaminsky, stand by. We'll be right back. And we're back with Perino on politics. Ross, I want to discuss your unique vantage point that I think it would be fascinating for me to to listen. You have a successful radio program in Colorado and you take calls and you get to hear from people. Um, What are they energized about right now? Yeah. And well, here's just a fun little kind of technology thing. These days I take way more texts than calls. Okay. Yeah. Because then I don't have the listeners distracting me. Uh, so I love listener texts. And and because KOA is such a big station, I'll typically get, especially if I ask for texts, a couple hundred texts in a show. I do think that the border and immigration issue is more of an emotional one than the cost of living issue. And so when you're talking to radio listeners, I, I think that is something that really has them fired up. That said, when you're talking about what's going to move the needle in an election, you know, a lot of the sort of moderate suburbanites, not necessarily people who listen to talk radio. And those are the people who Trump really needs to win. A lot of people think, you know this, but a lot of people think Trump got absolutely crushed in 2020 among suburban women. And he did badly among suburban women, but really where his huge fall off was, was with, with suburban men. And these are the people who who he needs to get. And I, I think I think on that, that's where cost of living comes in. And what I'm telling my listeners to focus on and what I would suggest that Trump focuses on, in addition to, of course, you know, cost of living broadly in the border is he should be talking about taxes, because if Biden gets elected again, the individual income tax rates that were lowered by Donald Trump, where even The New York Times had to write a piece grudgingly saying 
face it, you probably got a tax cut. If Biden gets elected again, your tax rates are going to go up. And if what I'm trying to push to my listeners and what I would say if I were Trump is, hey, if you think the cost of living is bad now, imagine how bad it's going to be when your taxes go up, which is what's going to happen if Biden wins. Yeah. What about Colorado and um, the issue of education and tying the marijuana legalization funding to education? Has that worked? Has it been a bad experiment? Would, I, I know that Governor Polis, at a, I think it was a year or two ago, at a national governor's convention, he told people, if you're thinking about experimenting with legalization of marijuana, I caution you, don't do it yet. So the way they set this up originally, if I recall correctly, is that uh, much of the marijuana tax money went to education construction, not so much the general fund to hire teachers and all that, but more like infrastructure stuff. Uh, the bottom line is they'll find that money wherever they, you know, wherever they can, wherever they need to. And separate from the fact that there's a lot of money from marijuana taxes going to that, the Democrats in this state still keep coming at us with tax hike after tax hike after tax hike saying it's for the children. Uh, there's going to be another one this year for the children and for veterans. You know, there's, it's always just, you know, rainbows and unicorns and kids and puppies and veterans. And, you know, I, I, what I would say to, to that is, is don't believe them when they say they're going to stop asking you for money about such and such a thing, if only you pass the tax. And then as far as the, the issue of whether it's worked out well in Colorado, look, I'm a libertarian. I believe that adults should be able to put anything in their body that they want to, as long as they don't drive under the influence and so on. Uh, I think that Colorado kind of got the worst of it because we were first. Yeah. And I think the fact that we were first caused so many people who I will um, without hesitation call undesirable to move to our state, just people who wanted to be stoned and be on welfare. And I don't like it at all. I don't like yeah. it at all. At this point though, because it's legal in so many places, I don't think there's that much downside to states legalizing um, again, I realize I have a more libertarian perspective. Yeah, I mean, I remember one of the first times that I ever expressed my own personal opinion on TV um, was probably 2011 when The Five was happening. Um, up until then, all of my professional life, I'd been a spokesperson for someone else. Um, Dan Schaefer of Colorado, uh, the the. Uh, Justice Department, Council on Environmental Quality, President Bush. And I come to the Fox and I remember we were doing a segment on the legalization of marijuana. And I started to give my thoughts that were based on what the Bush policy was in the administration and, and why I thought that was the right one. Well, I mean, I actually was just like describing the policy. And I'll never forget when Greg Gutfeld said, no, not what the policy was. What do you think? And I'll never yeah. forget that. I was like, wow, what do I think? Like, who cares what I think? I don't, I'm nobody. <laughs> uh, and it took me a while to get there. But I, um, I too, am like, okay, I get it. What, what's the difference between marijuana and alcohol? But then I also think that a lot of things that we've learned about how much TH THC is in marijuana today than it was in the 60s when people got this notion into their mind. What what's happening with our young people, the combination of the algorithms pushing things. And I want people to thrive in this country. They, we live in the greatest country in the world. You won the lottery if you were born here. Do you know how many people would have loved to have been born here? Look at immigration. They're trying to come here and we are here. And I just don't like mm -hmm. anything that diminishes the capability of people. But I just think also my last point on this is I think tying your education funding to the legalization of a product, be it sports gambling or marijuana, I, I think it's the wrong way to do it. And our K through 12 education is not improving. And I think that there's a lot of moms and dads out there who are saying, you know, we're paying huge property taxes. We allowed the legalization of marijuana, maybe in sports gambling in other states. And those things are not helping improve education. And I'll just give you the final word on that before we take a quick break before the next segment. 
So the reason that marijuana taxes are tied to education here, and we have sports gambling here too, and I forget what that money is. So I think it's supposed to go to water projects. Uh, the reason that they're tied like that is that's how they convince the public to support the legalization. And it, it's not so much that they care deeply about we need money for X, although they will pretend they do. It's that if we say the money is going to go to a good cause, then the organizations that stand to benefit by getting the thing legalized and stand to make a lot of money from it uh, can can sell it easier, uh, easier to the public. Um, so. So, Dana, I don't get to talk to you like this very often. Can I turn the tables on you and sure. ask you a question? Sure. Why did Donald Trump agree to all of the terms of Joe Biden's debate request? Like, I would have thought mm-hmm. he would have said, OK, yeah. I'll do it on that date, but not CNN or I'll do that. Yeah. But I want an audience. Yeah. So he he gave all of them. I'm wondering why you think he did it. I, you know, I, I don't know enough about the backstory. And I think it's remarkable how tight lipped and really good the leadership of his campaign is because nothing leaks. I mean, that you, one of the fun things about covering the Trump campaign in 2016 and 2020 is that you can find out anything. Uh, now they're, it's really locked down by Susie Wiles, who's an amazing uh, individual, and I hope to learn more about her. I don't, I don't have any insight as to why. My instincts would be that, um, one, you know, President Trump has said anytime, anywhere, any place, any rules. And I actually think that the things that they agreed to are not that bad. I really don't. I I think that having no audience, well, having been the moderator of a debate, but very different, a primary debate with all the Republicans that were still in at that time, where they agree on 96% of the issues and they were just basically trying to score some personal points against each other with their fans and the audience. I thought it was super unproductive and not helpful for people trying to make a decision. So I understand I am, I'm okay with no audience. I want to hear them. I don't really want to think about what they're saying. I also believe that having the mic cut off while the other person is talking is not a terrible thing for Donald Trump. One, it'll stop him from being look for, from interrupting. And it also will show that Joe Biden is going to have to finish a thought without being interrupted. Because if you notice in that one of those debates from 2020, President Trump kind of bailed him out a couple of times by an interruption. And I don't think that will happen. I also think that with the moderators, I think that people will I think it'll be pretty fine. I think they'll be fine over at CNN. I really do. Um, I hope that Fox gets a debate as well. I know that uh, we are working on that. So more to come on that. Hopefully, I think that Brett Baer and Martha McCallum are amazing at what they do. So I think, though, that maybe Trump will want a third debate and we'll see it. That's the one that I would not have agreed to. I think I would have agreed to the first one and the second one and raise the ante one more for one more in October. Because the Biden team has said the reason they want the one in June is to basically say that they've done it and that if they need time to recover from a bad experience, they'll have that time. Most incumbent presidents have a terrible first debate for their reelection. That included my old boss, too. Barack Hmm. Obama as well. Trump as well. Yeah. So Biden's first debate is likely to be bad and his team knows it. It feels very early to me to do that. The debate I'm dying to see is the vice presidential debate. So more to when come do you on think that. Trump, when do you think Trump will announce a VP pick? I think he'll wait. I don't think there's any hurry. And I, I think he'll want to get the trial behind him. And, you know, he the guy's a master of uh, suspense and showmanship and the Republican convention is mid-July, so he's got time. There's an interesting piece in National Review today by Neil Freeman, a a gentleman I do not know, but he wrote a piece saying that the short list for President Trump's VP list is too short, and he recommended an expansion of it. And I thought that was kind of interesting, so people can check that out as well. All right, Ross, we'll be right back. And welcome back to Perino on Politics. Ross, this is the question I like to ask everybody I have on because you are smarter than me. And that is, what do you pay attention to in politics right now or going into 2024 that I might not have on my radar or that you'd like to emphasize? 
I think Republicans have done, you mentioned Kerry Lake earlier, and I think she's an exception. I think Republicans are doing a pretty decent job this time around of picking better candidates uh, than they did last time. Uh, last time, Republicans nominated a lot of hardcore MAGA people that couldn't win general elections. Part of that, as you know, was done with the help of Democrats spending money advertising on behalf of the hardcore MAGA people, knowing that they would lose in the general elections. But I, I think you know, again, with the notable exception of Kerry Lake, there's some decent candidates out there. I I, uh, I lived in Montgomery County, Maryland, in, in Bethesda. I'm sure you know Bethesda very well uh, for quite some time. And that's going to be a really interesting one. Normally, you wouldn't think a Republican could have any chance in a Senate race there. But Larry Hogan, the former governor, is literally the only Republican who could possibly win the race. And the Democrats actually just chose uh, a candidate who was probably the weaker of the two in the general election. So I don't I don't know what's going to happen there. Got to keep an eye on Ohio as well. Bernie Moreno was not necessarily the strongest in the general election, but could possibly beat Sherrod Brown. So I'm I'm kind of focusing on on candidate quality. Here's oh actually you know what there's one other thing because I knew you were going to ask me something like this, <laughs> and uh, I'm. I'm really, really interested in seeing the huge percentage of the votes that Nikki Haley keeps wrapping, uh, racking up in these primaries. And I think most, not all, but most people who are voting in the primaries know that she's not in the race anymore. So is it Republicans who are saying, I can't stand Donald Trump? Or is it unaffiliated and independent voters? In Indiana, it could be unaffiliated and independent voters. She got something like 22% there. So what I'm really going to want to see is the, the Democrats who are voting for Haley because there's no point in voting in the, in the Biden primary, they're irrelevant because they wouldn't vote for Haley even if she were the nominee. But what about the Republicans voting for Haley? Will they end up deciding, I'm going to hold my nose and vote for Trump because Biden is unacceptable or are they going to stay home? The, if those people, quote unquote, come home and vote for the Republican nominee, then Trump's got a real good chance of winning. And, and if they don't, he won't. Yeah. Fascinating. All right, Ross, you've been amazing. I have a quick question that's a uh, multiple choice for you. I think you're going to get the answer. What national political party was founded in the state of Colorado? The Libertarian party the green party or the reform party oh my gosh i don't know uh i will say the libertarian party you're right it was in 1971 by david nolan founded in colorado springs no surprise there um and the libertarian party i would have guessed it was wyoming because that to me is right now as you mentioned at the top of the podcast the most libertarian state is still wyoming you know, I, I'm glad you asked this question because I asked my show listeners recently, can you tell me, and you, there could be more than one, a vote for president that you've made that you were truly proud of? And my personal answer was my first ever vote for president, which was Reagan's re-election, because I'm a little bit older than you. And just after that, voting for Harry Brown with an E on the end of Brown the libertarian candidate for president. Those are the votes I'm proud of. And there you have it. Ross Kaminsky, I'm proud to have you on the show. Proud to have you as a friend. I'm honored you were on. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for inviting me, Dana. I hope to see you in person soon. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts. And Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app.